Hello and welcome to Evaluating Web Development Frameworks for Delphi. My name is Jim McKeith and joining me on this webinar is Marco Cantu, our product manager. For the webinar, the lines will be muted except for Marco and myself, but you're still encouraged to ask questions using the Q&A panel on the right. We'll type answers to you as we go and then also take some time at the end to address them in more detail. There is Marco and my email address for you, as well as in the lower right-hand corner is the URL embt.co slash webdev2019, where you can find these slides, additional resources, downloads, and links for more information. We all know Delphi and FireMonkey are a winning combination for cross-platform development. But what does that mean for web apps? Can we take the same productivity, the same skill set, and the same tool we know and love and use it for web development? Well, the reality is it's really a question of choosing the right framework because there are quite a bit of frameworks to choose from. And we're going to go through those today so that you can understand which framework, which library you want to use or a combination thereof to be incredibly productive on the web. So why would you want to be on the web? Uh, here's some stats I pulled from a uh, slide deck Hootsuite put together. It goes into a ton of detail, breaking it down by uh, different regions and such. But the total population of the world is 7.676 billion people. And the number of unique mobile users is 5 billion. Well, got you covered there with Android and iOS support. But internet users, people on the web, is 4.3 billion. So there's probably some overlap there, but people are spending a lot of time on the web. The number of people online is growing. Uh, the rate slowed down a little bit, but it's still going pretty good at 9.1% from last year. And time spent per day, we see, is also uh, quite high. People on average across the world spend an hour, an average of six hours and 42 minutes. You can see the Philippines, apparently they spend over 10 hours there. Japan spends un about three hours, 45 minutes. And the U.S. is just below the worldwide average at six and a half hours. We're going to talk about different kinds of web development technologies, overview of the different frameworks, and then list the third-party solutions that address these different things there. We're going to have some examples and resources for more information. This is really kind of an overview, and I'm going to talk about a lot of these different frameworks in broad strokes in order to uh, group them together. It doesn't do justice to these different frameworks, and you really need to go out and look at them in more detail once you have a general idea of what you want to do. So additionally, uh, put a disclaimer in here, I'm going to be talking a lot about third-party frameworks in here. I may have made mistakes in my research, which was a lot of research involved. And so definitely follow up with their sites and make sure you verify their information there. Uh, I will enlist them as well to provide feedback, which I'll also include at that WebDev 2019 URL. So check out that page, bookmark it, visit it often. Hopefully my goal is that this will become a, a hub of resources for you in your web development. Additionally, like I said, I'm covering a number of third-party frameworks. It's not complete. Um, I keep thinking I'm done and then go back and add two more. And uh, at some point, I just have to stop and say, that's enough for now. There are probably a lot more web development frameworks out there for Delphi that I'm not covering. But there should be enough in here that you're going to have a good uh, overview of what's available. Okay, so when it comes to web, there are uh, four different technologies here. The HTML client app is what is running in your browser, okay? It's using HTML, the which is a markup language. You use HTML to specify how the text, what parts of text are what, if you will, okay? Cascading style sheets, CSS, is what's used to stylize and present that. Now, originally in HTML, there wasn't cascading style sheets, and you would set the font in the HTML, but that's changed. It's now separated between CSS and HTML. So CSS is the presentation, HTML is uh, the definition of the data. JavaScript provides interactivity in there. So if things change as you move around typically or you click on things and things happen, uh, that is typically JavaScript uh, there. Ajax is what allows you to pull data down without reloading the web page. Uh, anymore, that's just kind of the norm, but originally it was a big deal when Ajax support came out. Additionally, there are XML and JSON. Now, XML and JSON are similar, well, XML is similar to HTML. They both descend from SGML, Standard General Markup Language, and that's the angle brackets. Anytime you see angle brackets, it descends from SGML. Um, both XML and JSON are ways to indicate data. So typically, 
Xmelant JSON are not used to mark up data that is consumed by a human, but instead consumed by a computer, but has the advantage of being readable and editable by a human. J JavaScript consumes uh, XML or JSON, usually JSON. JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's designed specifically to be consumed by JavaScript and uses that to produce some um, content in a web page. Okay, so Ajax calls a REST server, REST Web API, web, which is a uh, stands for representational state transfer. It's a type. It's a way to describe an API. So Ajax use Ajax to call a REST API, pull down some JSON, then render that JSON as HTML style sheets applied to that. We're not gonna really go into SOAP at all today, but just wanted to mention that as well. We have great SOAP support. We've had great SOAP support for a long time in Delphi. Uh, SOAP is uh, XML based. It's more um, complex and robust than REST. SOAP's actually a protocol. REST just describes the way it's shaped, if you will. Um, anytime you try and define REST, someone comes out and says, oh, you didn't define it right. So I'm being vague, um, but REST was actually designed as an alternative to SOAP because SOAP was very complex and very heavyweight. Now, we're mostly going to be focused, actually, at this point forward, we're really just going to be focused on the first column there, the HTML client app. Uh, there's going to be some of the frameworks are uh, REST servers, and we're going to talk about that and how those work and how you can plug into those. But really, the main focus, the main emphasis, I want to be on the HTML client app. What's included with Rad Studio out of the box? There's a lot in there out of the box to support web technologies. Um, Data Snap, Rad Server, EMS Server, uh, both pretty essentially the same thing. Uh, Rad Server includes EMS Server, I guess. A Web Broker. Web Broker is actually the basis of a lot of these server-side technologies we're going to look at. SOAP services. And then we have client technologies for building client applications to connect to um, servers like REST servers or, web, or uh, web broker servers or SOAP servers. Number of client technologies, as well as some miscellaneous libraries like the ND library, uh, Windows Socket library. And like I said, we're really gonna be focused on uh, RAD server, EMS server, and web broker today, uh, as well as some third-party frameworks that are built around building beautiful client libraries. So is this just Delphi specific? No, it's not. Uh, most of these frameworks also work with C++ Builder, but the frameworks themselves and the demos and the documentation usually are written in Delphi, which means if you are a C++ Builder user, you can use most of the stuff we're gonna talk about today, but you're gonna to need to understand how the interop works. Uh, typically C++ is able to consume uh, object Pascal Delphi code really, really well, but there may be some issues there. Your mileage may vary. The notable exception to this is transpilers. We're gonna talk about transpilers in a little bit, but transpilers are focused on object Pascal. Now, if you're a C++ developer and you're okay doing a little object Pascal, totally take advantage of these transpilers. They're really powerful, really great. And then you're going to be able to have the best of both worlds, as it were. Let's talk about Web Broker. And for that, I'm going to turn things over to Marco, and he's going to give you a little overview of Web Broker. Hi, this is Marco Cantu, and thanks, Jim, for this introduction. What I'll do in this small section is cover Web Broker, which is one of the foundations for all the web technologies that are available in Delphi and as third-party add-ons. The key idea of Web Broker is to abstract the concept of um, HTTP server by implementing a layer that allows you to map different web server technologies from the good old CGI to ISAPI to Apache modules or even standalone indie servers and these bridges Windows and uh, Linux alike. The idea is that you just work with an abstract HTTP server request and HTTP server response. And these are mapped to specific classes depending on the technologies you are actually using. But all of your code can move as is from Linux to Windows, from ISAPI to CGI to a web module without making any significant change, save for the project file. The other concept around Web Broker is that it maps URLs to actions. For each action, you can determine the HTTP verbs that are implemented, and you can provide a specific content type in the result. It also supports concepts like filters and global handlers, but that's not something we'll, we'll have time to, to focus on. Now, Web Broker still comes with some 
producer component that are fairly old fashioned in the way they work. So I'm, I'm not going to focus on them. But what I want to do is to take you through a quick tour of web broker by looking into a single application that can either return HTML, a page or JSON, some data. This is my web broker application. It has a placeholder form, nothing too interesting. This is something that shows if you're compiling it as for debug with, with a UI, but not something you would deploy. And then the web module, which is a data module with a specific integration of actions. And you can also see the actions here with, um, in this case, a default handler and a data handler. If you open the action editor, you can see how the actions are mapped to specific path. Uh, this is the root path or default, and it also serves as default. So if you are hitting a non-existing URL, direct to this default. And data, which is a very specific one. Again, for each of them, you can determine the HTTP methods that are available, and you can hook to a component that's going to produce a result, or just hook to custom actions with an on-action event handler. Now for the default on action event handler produces some hard coded HTML. The only thing that's dynamic is showing the time on the server to produce JSON. What I'm doing here again in, in this very simple demo, I'm creating a JSON object, a single JSON object, adding a name value pair to it where the name is value and the value is a JSON number. I return it as the content of the response and I set the content type from the default HTML to uh, application slash JSON. With this code, if I run the application and start it, I mean, enabling the part for the service, if I open the browser and point it to 8080, you can see the resulting page with dynamically generated content. If I hit slash data, I'm not getting a web page, but I'm just getting the raw JSON data structure for the JSON object that I return. Again, nothing fancy, nothing terribly sophisticated in terms of resulting UI or web service, but also an extremely simple, straightforward approach with a lightweight, extremely lightweight engine that a lot of the other technology we're going to discuss in the rest of the way this webinar are going to be uh, based on. And with that, uh, back to Jim. Thank you, Marco, for that quick overview of Web Broker. Web Broker is server focused, but we're going to expand that now as we talk about some select third party frameworks. I'm dividing these up into three categories and painting with broad strokes here. So there may be some overlap here and uh, they don't all perfectly fit in each of these categories. But I want to do this so that you had an idea, kind of a map of where to go. Uh, you're going to want to check out the uh, more information from those vendor websites, developer websites, which I'll provide you links for so that you can have more information. I've researched this quite a bit, but I may have made some mistakes. So certainly do follow up with them for the final work. So I'm dividing this into three categories. The first category is the Pascal to JavaScript transpilers. These are client focused. The second category is the client server frameworks. These are a full stack or balanced approach, if you will. And the third category is REST servers. These are server focused categories. Now you can certainly combine a, a REST server with a transpiler and come up with a full stack balanced approach or mix these up however you see fit. Uh, the REST servers and client server framework should work with C++ Builder. The transpilers are specific to Object Pascal, so they're not going to work as well with C++, but if you are fine writing part of your application in Object Pascal and part of it in C++, then you certainly can take advantage of those as well. So let's talk about transpilers. Transpilers take Object Pascal and convert it into JavaScript. The idea is that you can leverage your skills with Object Pascal and still produce pure JavaScript output. Most of these take advantage of either uh, Delphi Web Script, DW Script, or Pass2JS. Uh, so you can go to those directly if you'd rather, but they also add a lot on top of that. Uh, support libraries, IDEs, 
designers, so on and so forth. Now, the idea of this abstraction or separation or transpiler is not unique to the Delphi world. Uh, the idea of some sort of translating compiler or some sort of higher level language over JavaScript is pretty common. Uh, CoffeeScript was really big a few years back. Now TypeScript is what people are using as it adds the type safety and better features, better validation, easier to maintain to your JavaScript applications. So because JavaScript is really, it's kind of a low level language, you can mess things up pretty bad and it's interpreted so you don't know it's not right until it fails. The advantage of using Object Pascal as a higher level language is it's got type safety and there's a lot of things that are easy to do in Object Pascal that are harder to do in JavaScript. So this get, makes your applications easier to maintain and also uh, safer. And the advantage also is that you don't need to know JavaScript. So you already know Object Pascal if you're here today, so you don't need to know JavaScript and you're ready to go. First transpiler we're gonna talk about is Elevate Web Builder. I've been a big fan of Elevate software for years and uh, I was excited to see when they introduced this a few years back. We did a webinar, a couple of webinars with them, if I remember correctly, uh, around it. So it has its own Delphi-like IDE uh, with components similar to the VCL. So you have a design surface, you put down components, and then you write Object Pascal, a similar dialect to Delphi. It includes uh, T data set and data access components so that you can consume data from uh, a data snap server, for example, and display it to the user. Additionally, they have a, a web module, web server module that you can write Delphi modules for and run on the server on Windows and consume those from it as well. So they kind of have their own full stack, if you will. Uh, but it is mostly focused, or at least I categorized it as mostly being focused on the client side. Smart Mobile Studio is another big player in this space. They've been around for uh, a while. They, if I remember correctly, are using DW script, but they've expanded quite a bit off the standard uh, Delphi, most of them based on Delphi 7 compatibility, but they've gone beyond that, added a lot of new features as well to the language. But essentially you're writing in Object Pascal and then it compiles into JavaScript. Now it has, they have their own IDE, lots of components, own RTL, and then they can compile that down to uh, a web page that you can render in your browser, or they also have targets for Node.js, so you can use it to build your server backend, uh, Tizen, a console applications, Esperino, which is uh, for Arduino, and more. Free commercial or free command line compiler and free for educational purposes edition, and it comes in three versions, basic professional enterprise. You can check out, find out more information at their website, smartmobilestudio.com. Uh, definitely check this out. They do a lot of great stuff, and a lot of people involved in this one as well. Third one is TMS WebCore. Uh, I'm a huge fan of TMS. They have so many great tools. If you're not using TMS components, definitely go out there and check it out. You're probably gonna find something that you need. TMS WebCore is different in that it integrates into the Delphi IDE, all right? So you're writing Object Pascal using the designer, dragging and dropping components onto the form and building a, a TMS WebCore application right inside the IDE. It then compiles and debugs right there from the IDE into your browser. It's really amazing. I've seen demos that you can debug into your code, put a breakpoint in your Object Pascal code, and then have something happen in the browser and it triggers that breakpoint and you can see the Object Pascal. A couple other things they do differently is they have this cross-platform component library called FNC that does FireMonkey, uh, WebCore, VCL, and others. And that, so they get a component framework and it works across all these platforms. So if you want to be able to use the exact same components uh, in multiple platforms, you can do that with TMS as well. And it works with different backend servers. It'll work with a RAD server, I believe it works with Datasnap, and it works with TMS's own Xdata. Well, one thing specific about WebCore is it works with your favorite CSS styles. So if there's a specific CSS style that you want to use, you can take advantage of that and also works with the JavaScript frameworks. Uh, I believe they are working on, if they haven't already released, support for XJS. So if you want to use XJS on the client side and have all the power of XJS there, you can certainly do that. Um, or you can use uh, jQuery, uh, Bootstrap, other popular frameworks and style sheets out there. Some alternatives to transpilers. Just write JavaScript. I think it's a good idea for everybody to know some JavaScript, just like it's a good idea for everybody to know some assembly. There are advantages to not using just plain JavaScript as well. 
mentioned, TypeScript is very popular. It adds type safety and compatibility while being compatible with JavaScript, designed by Anders Halsberg, who also designed uh, Pascal and Delphi. So there may be some compatible mindshare genetic relationship in there. You might be able to take advantage of as a Delphi developer. And then also XJS, which is a JavaScript framework, but it's one of the more popular and powerful ones out there. Essentia makes XJS, which is owned by IDERA, our parent company. There are other JavaScript frameworks out there, but obviously I'm gonna mention this one. I'm gonna demonstrate some of this real short quickly to you, but I'm not gonna do justice to any of these. Do visit embt.co slash webdev2019 for links to the individual libraries websites for more information. Let's take a look at Elevate Web Builder version 2.05. Fire up Elevate Web Builder it has its own IDE. It looks like it's gonna be very familiar to you if you're familiar with uh, using Delphi Rad Studio, you'll find it very familiar. So let's go ahead and make a new project. And you can make a visual or non-visual project. We're gonna make a visual project and your options for different kinds of base forms. Uh, we're just gonna go with a regular form, regular type of project. Now from here, I can come up here and add uh, com components to my project. Here's just like it was a regular project. And the button, right? Yep, button, okay. And you'll notice T list box, T edit, T button, very similar to uh, Delphi. So now I'm going to just say uh, list box one dot items dot add edit one dot text. I recognize this code as being used in many a Delphi demo. From here, I can compile it and ask me where I want to save it. I'll just save it here and I can run it in the uh, embedded window. Okay, so here it is, the button, hello world. Now the code, I can jump out here and see the code. This is the project code here. Here is the output. This is what's created by it. We see we have an HTML file and a JavaScript file. Now I can open this JavaScript file up and this is the JavaScript that is generated by what I wrote. Now, you can see most of this is, I didn't write this. <laughs> no, I didn't write this, the code that became this. This is the base library for the most part. Uh, it's quite a bit here. So as you write more, there's gonna be more code that's put in here that you wrote, but um, it's also gonna include this base library and some of the other libraries included. I didn't bother looking to see if I could find search for list box one. Yeah, there it is. So here's where, uh, this is the form setup I'm guessing here. And, oh yep, yeah, they're initializing those objects. And there we go. That's the code I wrote right there. That's the one line of code I wrote is where it's adding the item to the list box. But there you go. That's a brief introduction to Elevate Web Builder. I did not get into the database manager at all, which it has for support to write Delphi backends that expose data to it and manage that. TMS Web Core by TMS Software. One thing I'll point out, make sure you come out here. There's a lot of uh, demo videos here, way more than I'm gonna cover uh, shortly here in this little quick demo, but just wanted to give you uh, a quick intro to it. So I'm just gonna hear file new other. I could add it to that menu through customize. And here I can see TMS web application, uh, progressive web application, Electron, which is the, the GitHub client, for example, we built with that, and console application. So here we are, we're just in the IDE, just like normal. And I can come right here and find the TMS web edit button and list box. And I can maneuver these around just like I would any other type of control. I can also set properties and object inspector, uh, all the usual stuff. I will point out we have a separate tab here for the project HTML. So this is where you could uh, include additional JavaScript libraries or style sheets, stuff like that. And here's the code. So I'll go back here to design, I double click on the button, and I can just say 
web list box one dot items dot add and web edit one dot text. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and run this. I'll save it in a new folder. So let's and we'll just get the default name. So there was an extra save in there because of the HTML file as well. I am using the trial version right now. So we'll just hit the button, adds that there. We'll say hello world, hit the button, and hello TMS. Boom, so tabs, big characters are gonna work like you expect. That's is really cool. I I'm just really excited about all these things here. Uh, in here, we can come down and say show and explore and jump out here. And in the TMS web folder, we see there is the JavaScript and HTML files it produced for me. There's other options, way more that this can do. Um, so check out the website for more information on TMS web. Client server frameworks. These are the balanced or full stack approach to building web applications. So how does this work? Your framework, you're going to use the framework to build an application. And that runs, usually with a web broker as the core, on the server. Okay, And then the server produces the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that is sent to the client. Okay, With the transpilers, you frequently are just producing uh, HTML and JavaScript files that you put on the web server and get loaded into the browser. There's nothing specific that needs to run on the server side. So with those, they are pure client solutions, whereas these are server solutions that produce a client. Okay, so they're a server solution that makes it easier to produce a nice client. The client application that you produce with these frameworks can call back to, or does call back to your server you produced for data or interactivity, but can also call to external REST APIs uh, on different servers to obtain data there as well. First one we're going to talk about is A to Z software's intraweb. Not only is A to Z come first in the alphabet, but A to Z's intraweb's was the first one in this space. Been around for a long time, very big player. Uh, big fan of Chad Hauer. He's done a lot of great works. So I remember seeing him at uh, Borcons years ago, learning about Indie, which he's also involved in the development of Indie. So if you're a fan of Indie, which everybody is, you definitely owe it to yourself to check out uh, intraweb. Version 14 was bundled with Delphi for years, previous versions as well. It's still free for Rio developers, so check it out there at the website. You can available via Git it, or uh, it's bundled, I think, in the ISO download, but not the web installer, or you can just visit the website to grab it there as well. Version 15 is the current version, adds new features, including Linux server support, and then version 17 is under development. They skipped 16 because 17 is such a huge step forward. We did a webinar with them at Code Rage about version 17. So the way Intro works, it installs into the IDE. You're using the design surface, dragging components on there. Design, they're based on VCL. And then you write Delphi code. But unlike a, a transpiler, that Delphi code does not turn into JavaScript. Instead, when the user clicks a button or does something to interact with the code, it makes a call back to the server. So your code's still running on the server but then um, it's rendering, the presentation is rendered in the browser. You can also do the uh, extensibility via TypeScript or JavaScript where you can have code that execute in the browser, but you don't have to, okay? So you can do this just uh, in the server side and have everything validated on the server, all that behavior on the server, or do it in the client side with JavaScript or TypeScript. One advantage of interweb besides being one of the more mature, robust ones around is that they have uh, third-party components available. Quite a few of them uh, adding support for different frameworks or extending it in different ways. Next one we're gonna talk about is FMSoft's Unigui. I know a lot of people love this framework. Uh, it's uh, similar to interweb. It installs in the IDE, use the design surface, very VCL-like controls, and it can also use JavaScript for client-side events. Athea Kitto 2 is also using XJS for the client side, and it's designed around data-driven. 
Now the big difference between Kitto and the other ones is Kitto does not have a visual designer. They have a separate IDE called KIDE, a Kitto IDE or Kitty, that you can use to define how your UI looks, but you're not, it's not a visual designer, okay? So it's designed around the idea of data-driven applications like a grid. Now you're gonna put a grid up, it's not gonna show you the grid and let you move the width of the columns around, etc. But it does let you say, I want a grid that has this many columns and I want this data to go in this column, this data to go in this column, and I wanna have the columns look like this, behave like this, etc. So you, it's like having the object inspector to define the grid, but you're not visually uh, previewing it and designing it in uh, visually. So Kitto works with um, Web Broker and you use uh, Kitto to define how Web Broker will produce XJS that it is sent to the browser, all right? It, it, if you're wanting to build data-driven solution, this is a great way thing to look at. The other big difference between the other two is it's open source. I believe Kitto 1 was a closed source commercial application. Kitto 2 is now open source. So it's really focused around building the uh, JavaScript powered XJS data driven applications. So again, I'm gonna do a couple demonstrations here. Not gonna cover all this in detail, but you can find more links to more videos at embt.co slash webdev2018. Okay, so here I am in the IDE and I have Unigui installed. Now the license that I have for Unigui is for a slightly older version and so I'm using Rad Studio 10.1 Berlin, but Unigui is available for 10.3 Rio as well. I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to start a Unigui application. We go to File, New, Other, and because Unigui is installed, we have this new category, Unigui for Delphi. And within here, we have the application wizard and the ability to add data modules, forms, and frames to our project. I'm gonna go ahead and start a new project. And here I have a selection of the types of project that I can build. Uh, Zappi module is a plugin for Windows IIS server. So that's for your HTTP server. Standalone server allows us to run this locally on our local machine as a standalone uh, application. And you can also build this as a Windows service to install uh, into the operating system. Uh, this option here, standalone server and Zappi module, creates a project that you can build and deploy either as a standalone or as an Zappi module. Uh, so that's quite useful for debugging on the uh, standalone and then deploying to IIS with Zappi. I'm going to go ahead and stick with standalone today because I don't plan to deploy it. Uh, and I'm going to set a project name. Now, what I'm actually going to build today will be a oversimplified IDE for building a Pascal project. So I'm going to go ahead and call this Uni IDE, and that'll be my project. So let the application do its work. And we get this new template application with a main form that uh, pretty much everybody will be familiar with. So I have several uh, files here. I have the main unit and main form, and I also have a main module. Now the main module is where I can put my uh, data com components. So I could put my FireDAC components on here or ADO components on here, whatever data source you are using. Uh, and then there's the server module. Now if we take a look at the server module, this is the piece that actually represents our server application. So this is where we will find the uh, IP binding uh, parameters, for example, and the port number that we're going to run on. Now, if this is installed as an Izapi into your IIS server, then your IIS server is going to determine the port number. So it's going to be on port 80 or 443 or whatever you have IIS configured for. Uh, the standalone server, on the other hand, is going to be running on port 877 as set here in this property. So I'm going to go ahead and just run this template application as it is. And once we have that built and started up, nothing happened. And the reason is that this is a, a server running in the background and we need to connect to it with a browser. So I'm gonna open up Chrome here and I'll browse to localhost port 877. Okay, so now I'm in the browser and I can see my application here. I can see the main form and I can drag this around, minimize, maximize, and do all those uh, fun things with it as though it were a desktop application. Now there are options to make your main form fill the entire browser uh, and things like that. So if you wanted to set up a full width application, you could do that. But I quite like this floating window, so I'm just gonna stick with that for now. But I do want to make it a little bigger. So I'm gonna go ahead and close down my application here. I'm gonna make this 
form a little bigger, and then we'll look at how we build the application out. Now, it's quite familiar for most uh, VCL developers to drag and drop components onto a form, and Unigui is, Unigui is no different. However, the regular controls obviously won't work. You'll get this error message. The reason is that these are native Windows controls, they're not Unigui controls. We need specifically the Unigui controls for our form. So if I type UNI into my search box here, you can see that I get uh, this Unigui standard tab and I have some controls listed under here. There are actually about four or five tabs and around 80 controls, 80 visual controls. I'm gonna start by putting a Uni toolbar on my form. So I'm gonna select the Uni toolbar and it's automatically aligned top. I'm gonna to add a separator and a button to my form. And this button is gonna be my run button. So it's gonna run my application source code. Uh, I want to put an image on that button. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick out a Uni image list drop that on my form and then just like the regular VCL image list I'm going to double click to add images click on the add button and I have this play icon unfortunately it doesn't have a transparent background so it is going to interfere with our background a little bit but obviously you can take more care with your uh, icons click on OK and to set the image list for the toolbar exactly the same as you would do under VCL we come and set uni image list 1 and then for the button, again, image index, the same as with VCL, and I can set the image that I want there. Okay, so I have this little run button. I need some source code for it to run. Well, Unigui actually comes with, if I scroll down to the controls here, Unigui standard, uh, Unigui extra, uh, actually comes with a syntax editor. So I'm gonna go ahead and select this syntax editor, drop it on my form, and set the alignment to client. Now, I just noticed as I'm looking at this, oh, sorry, I want the alignment to top. There we go. Okay, so I just noticed as I'm looking at this list, the uni chart, and I did want to point out that Unigui has uh, this charting component. It also has these database aware components, uh, a list of uh, other useful HTML components, and the standard components that you'll be familiar with, checkbox edit, list box, label, memo, and so on. So uh, quite a wealthy, as I said, around 80 components, quite a wealthy selection there. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, change the size of my edit box here and put my toolbar back my toolbar back at the top. And then I want a splitter. So I'm gonna go for a Unigui splitter. Again, pretty much uh, all of the standard VCL controls are represented in some fashion here. So I have uh, my splitter and it's aligned left. Let's align it top. And then I'll get a memo and place that on my form as well. It needs to be a uni memo. Okay, and I'm gonna align this to client. Okay, so I have my little application built here. This editor is going to be for my source code. So I'm gonna change the name of this control to source and I'm gonna remove the lines of text from it. And then I'm actually gonna use this memo at the bottom as the output of my application. So I'm gonna name it to output and take the source lines out of that as well. Okay, so I have a very basic IDE here. What I'll do is I'll enter some source into this source box, click on my run button, have that source uh, compiled or interpreted run the source code and generate some output. So I need a program for that and let's go ahead and put a program in now. Program test, begin, end, and write them. Hello, Unigui world. And that'll be the little program that I'm gonna have run. Now that's uh, my, now that's my form set up. Uh, what I'm going to do now is start binding the events. Now there are two types of events that you can run in Unigui. The first type of event that I'm going to show you is a client-side event, and this type of event is not written in Pascal. The server-side events are, but client-side events are JavaScript. So effectively we can come into this client events property, ext events, find the uh, event that we want to handle, and enter our JavaScript code in here. Now the reason I point this out is that sometimes it is useful to do client-side events. For example, if you wanted to do a uh, input validation without a round-trip communication to the server, then you could do that using JavaScript. However, the communication with the server is really quite efficient 
and you could even do input validation on a round trip and handle the event server side using Delphi code. So let's see how we do that. Well, it's exactly the same as with the VCL. We click on the control we want, come over to the events tab, and we can select the event that we want to handle. The default for this control is on click. So if I double click the button, I get my on click event and I can go ahead and handle it. Let's go ahead and just put something in the output box right now. If I do output.lines.text equals hello and run my application. And I'm gonna open my browser on localhost 877. And here is my application with this source code. Obviously, I'm not running this source code at the moment. When I click the button, I just get hello come out in my output. But we can take a look and see that our splitter works. We can see that our source code is syntax highlighted and our button event handler works quite nicely. So let's go ahead and complete this application. And this is where we step away from UniGUI a little for a moment. Uh, I've actually installed the Jedi components into my IDE. You can do that by going to Tools, Get It, and doing a search for Jedi. And install the JCL and JVCL component packages. So with those components installed, we get access to something called the JV interpreter. So if I go down and find the tab here, JV interpreter, I want this JV interpreter program. So this is a Pascal interpreter that we can embed in our application. And what this is demonstrating really is that non-visual components can be added into your uh, UniGUI application. So this is a non-visual component from a third party. We're going to add it in. And what we need to do is make this build and run our source code. So I'm going to come into uh, my main program on the button event, and I'm going to take out this hard-coded output, and I'm going to put in two lines that I prepared earlier, JV interpreter program one dot paths for the Pascal file dot text is being set to the lines of source code that I have in my source editor, and then I call JV interpreter program dot run. Now the interpreter by default doesn't understand writeLin. So we've got a writeLin in our code here and it doesn't know this function, we need to tell it about this function. And the way that we do that is with this other little pre-prepared line of code that I have. Okay, so this is the global JV interpreter adapter add function. We're adding a function to the system library so that we don't need to include users to use it. Uh, we're calling this function writeLin we're going to have a function which will handle the event. Uh, so when writeLin is called, we'll have a function uh, perform that action. This function will have one parameter. The parameter will be a type string, and the return type will be null. So we need the uh, handler function for this, and I'm going to go ahead and copy it across, and then we'll take a look at how this works. So this is my handler to handle the writeLin function. I'm going to pass back, as a result, a variant. Well, this has no result, it's a procedure, not a function. So we're not gonna do anything with the value parameter here, but the arguments parameters will have one argument and that argument will be the string that we pass into the right one call. So what we need to do is, I'm just gonna skip the beginning of the line here for a moment. We're gonna to come to output, which is our memo and lines and add, and we're gonna add the first argument that gets passed into our write -in function, which of course will be the string that we want to write. So that's how that function works, but what is this stuff here? Well, uh, VCL applications have a variable usually within the, the form unit, and that variable is the instance of the form. So when you create the instance, uh, the reference gets set into that variable. UniGUI works a little differently here. Uh, it actually has this function main form, which returns T main form. And it does that using this bit of code here. It goes and gets the instance of the form and converts it and typecasts it to a T main form. So I've basically just copied the same. I guess I could have called the main form function here, but I've just copied the same functionality to get access to my output uh, memo there. Okay, so with that done, our program should be complete. Let's go ahead and try our IDE. So I start up my server, open my browser on localhost, and here we have program test, begin, end, write, learn. If we run this, we should get hello GUI, uh, hello UniGUI world come out down here. And there we get it. So now we can actually, uh, within our web browser, we can go ahead and modify this program 
change it to hello crawl world and when we run it we now get hello crawl world so just an example there of how familiar building applications is for vcl developers with unigui This is a short video I got from Interweb showing some of the new features they have coming in version 17, which is available now in beta. This is showing how you can consume data via REST live and quickly build a client application to consume that data. You can find out more information about Interweb. Uh, it's available via Get It, version 14 is, or visit uh, A to Z software website to sign up for the beta. Now we're going to talk about REST servers. REST servers are server-focused solutions, um, but they do frequently have client applications, client samples, or libraries you can use on the client side, but they're really focused on uh, server development. These work by producing a REST server that you then produce data that can be consumed by a client. Now that client can be a web client, or it could be a, uh, a rich client, a full native client which could be on Windows or mobile. So if you're wanting to have a, a, a large scale solution that can be consumed by lots of different types of clients, you might want to check out REST server and then use a transpiler to create your web client for it. And then Delphi FireMonkey to produce your Android, iOS, Windows, Mac OS, et cetera clients. Beyond the three I'm gonna talk about also, uh, RAD server, DataSnap, and WebBroker are REST servers that are included in Delphi Enterprise Architect. So you can take advantage of those uh, or these third-party frameworks, which for the most part are based on WebBroker. First one is Synopse Mormit. Mormit like the uh, marmot, a little uh, rodent that lives in the ground, uh, which they use a lot on their site, is a ORM SOC MVC framework the it's a full stack doesn't use web broker so i said most of these use web broker this one doesn't uh, but it is a full stack it has a lot of stuff in this library it's a very big library it's useful beyond just web de development it has a number of different uh, architectures you can use name pipes for example to communicate data it has an integrated spider monkey javascript engine for server-side business logic so you can actually write javascript that runs on the server with this so the idea here is it, ha it makes it easy for you to produce a, red, a REST server that can be consumed by a variety of different clients. Open source, you can find out more at uh, synops.info or mormot.net. Mars Curiosity is probably the newest one in this list here. It's uh, designed to be a lightweight, easy to use REST library that's built on top of web broker, uses all the latest modern Delphi features. I'm gonna make a general generality statement here, but when you're using a a framework that's newer, then it's able to take advantage of the newer language features, whereas the older frameworks frequently try to have maintained backwards compatibility. I'm a big fan of backwards compatibility, but it's nice at some point to be able to take advantage of newer features as well, uh, which Mars Curiosity does its best to do that. It has uh, support for FireDAC for database, accessing databases, and then being able to publish it as 100% RESTful web service. It's designed to be able to get up and running with in just five minutes. Open source, you can find more information available there on GitHub. Delphi MVC Framework um, is another great REST framework that's available. Again, it's based on web broker, includes an IDE wizard, runs on Apache or IIS, Linux and Windows. The other ones do as well. Actually, the Mormot runs on Windows. You have to use free Pascal if you want to target Linux. I'm not sure why they don't take advantage of the Delphi Linux compiler, although that might be outdated information. Uh, Delphi MVC framework, I want to point out, has a book coming soon. Daniel Tete has written a number of Delphi books. If you haven't checked those out, definitely check those out. And he's working on one around uh, his MVC framework that he's developed as well. So that's a huge definite plus to check this one out. My plan was to demo some of these REST servers. Unfortunately, because of time, I'm not going to be able to. Do visit embt.co slash webdev2019, and I will link to some demos and more information for you there. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Marco, and he will do a 
rad server plus ex.js demo for you. This is Marco again, and after Jim has walked you through a bunch of different third-party options and libraries for web development, I want to spend a little time with you covering one alternative and fairly different approach, which is completely separating the server-side development of your web service to the client-side development of your web application. While I want to focus on Rad server, before I'm doing that and going through a demo, I want also to shortly mention Datasnap, which is the other solution included in Delphi Enterprise and Architect Edition. Uh, both provide REST APIs, both are under development, but while Datasnap has a lot of backwards compatibility with older technologies, like having COM support and TCP IP support, it added later HTTP and REST layers on top of the core architecture, and that makes the implementation of REST in Datasnap a little less modern and clean compared to other solutions like REST server. Datasnap advantage is that it's been available for a long time. A lot of our customers have built solution with it, and we still support it as a way to building all of the pieces you need for your multi-tier architecture. On the contrary, RAD server doesn't allow you to build your own application in full, but is a turnkey solution, is a ready-to-use server where you deploy your own packages to extend the core API, which is already there and existing and ready to use, including user management, groups, permissions, there is extensive API analytics. There are a lot of features built into the system, and also it offers some more modern REST and method mapping, it has a first-class JSON support and a very clean implementation of the various HTTP verbs and how they map to your code. Also, we are now started offering ready-to-use components. You just drop into your server to allow rapidly building server-side applications. Finally, it also has multi-tenancy support, so the ability to isolate the different users in separate groups and identify them as their requests. Comes in. Now, focusing on RAD server and the RAD server XJS combination, the key concept is that RAD server is not a web solution, but it's a web service solution primarily. So you generally match it with a separate HTML solution or HTML plus JavaScript solution for your web front end. For example, here I'm going to use XJS, but you could also use Angular, use other web front ends for building the client that will access data provided by RAD server. I think this is a quite a relevant approach because it allows you to use mainstream web technologies for your web UI and web development following the latest standards and approaches. At the same time, you can still leverage your data access layers, your business logic, and compile that in a Delphi application that provides the data to the client and the web UI. In most cases, it makes sense to separate the server-side development and the client side, although I agree that it's handy and it's faster to have a tool that uh, allows to work on both sides. Now what I'm going to do here is demo how to use RAD server to expose database data via JSON REST. I'm actually not going to use the new 10.3 EMS components, which offer the easiest approach, I'm just going to show you how you could write code on the server. Again, code you can decide to skip by going through a um, component level solution. And I'm also going to use Sensor Architect very quickly to build a client application, defining a data model, mapping to the URL on the server, and then define a UI to display the data. Now I'm not going to do all of these steps, but just show you the result. So first, let me show you my RAD server solution. It's a simple data module with a database connection, a query that returns the classic employee table from the employee interbase database. And with that, I have code on the server that similarly to what I showed at the beginning with the in the web broker demo, creates a JSON data structure using the tjson update tjson array structure from the system JSON unit. In this case, I'm creating an array, and then I'm creating one object for each record of my table. And for each object, I'm adding name value pairs for each of the fields. 
and at the end I wrap my array into as the field of an employee object and return it as part of the response body of the RAT server invocation. This is mapped to a resource name called employee data, so that becomes the endpoint, the URL I can hit to execute this server-side code. That's all needed in the Delphi application. I started this server, so I have it running here. This is my RAT server running on port 8080 on this machine. Now let's see how the XJS client is configured and developed. I can show you the client running actually on my Mac. First thing, I've defined a model for my data with first name, last name, phone extensions, and, and job country. This is the actual code behind it. I don't want all of the fields from my client. I only want some of the fields. Next, I map a JSON store, a storage to the model, and I define the configuration for the storage simply by indicating the type and pointing to the URL of my Windows machine on my other machine where the server is running and employee data, which is the endpoint in the browser. In fact, if I point to, to this data structure directly, you can see the JSON that is being returned by the server. In Sencha Architect, I refer to the same URL and I'm retrieving that data structure. Notice that I have an employee root object, so I need to set this, this root property value in the reader configuration, actually. And this is how it knows to look under the employee element of the JSON. So with this configuration, I have my storage defined and I can also preview my data with the proper formatting. If I close it, I can do the last step, which is check my UI. I have a grid, but I'm going to switch to the design of the grid. And you can see in this tab of the grid, I have, sorry, I have this grid in this tab, which is hooked, which has multiple fields and each of the fields is configured to be hooked to the matching field in the data model. So for example, first name is the index of the first name column and so forth for the other columns. So I can define all of my columns and configure them and I can even preview my data at design time in Architect even before I finish building the application in XJS. This approach allows you to use any web technology, any web library, any JavaScript library you want and separate the client-side development to the server-side development. Now, now let me finish this section by saying that we are planning a deeper integration with XJS and possibly even other web technologies, but with the approach of keeping the server and the client as separate tool rather than building um, solution that generates the client from Delphi code. So we've seen the demo and now back to Jim for the last part. Great. Thank you, Marco, for that. Uh, wasn't able to cover everything we wanted to cover today. Even the things we covered, we weren't able to cover in as much detail. So I wanted to point you to a few additional frameworks and resources. I have no idea how to pronounce that, but SGC's web broker and WebSockets is uh, XGC's web broker is an extension on web broker adding additional functionality, which essentially the other ones I showed you were also extensions, if you will. Uh, it's a commercial solution and they also have web sockets. If you're not familiar with web sockets, it's a way to open up a connection and then send data bi-directionally between the server and the client. Uh, very powerful solution for, with that. Uh, IP works. Also, I believe there's, there's a free Delphi version of this, but they have commercial versions as well with additional functionality. It's an extensive collection of network and web protocols. A lot of different things in there you can take advantage of. And then Radus, Radius, R-A-U-D-U-S, web framework. Uh, it's similar uh, to the other ones I showed you, um, similar to Unigui, but it uses using XJS. It has The website hasn't been updated recently, and sometimes I find that uh, people that are developing these are really busy developing the application and not so busy updating the website. So it could be that it's still available. I think it's like a couple of versions of Delphi uh, 
uh, was the last time it was updated. So it may still be updated. Check it out. I sent him an email to ask, but I haven't heard back yet. Some additional open source. So those three were commercial. Uh, some additional open source solutions is Delphi WebScript, which I mentioned earlier, DW script. Uh, MVCBR is available in Get It. It's another MVC solution. Overbyte, ICS, and middleware. Uh, real popular ones out there. ICS is similar to Indie, and middleware is an interior development framework. You can find those at overbyte.eu. I think they used to be commercial, but now they're open source. And then Delphi Cross Socket is a cross platform socket library. So, similar to Indie, uh, if you want an alternative socket library, check that out as well. Another thing which we didn't go into, but I wanted to make a call out to is remoting systems. Now, there's one, uh, Cybelsoft's Thinfinity Virtual UI, that is designed specifically for Delphi developers. And what this does is you make a simple modification to your Windows program, which usually just involves adding a single line of code, although you can take advantage of additional features as well. You recompile it, and your application now runs on the server but produces that same user interface in the web browser. Pretty neat. That's, an, that's the fastest way to just go from a uh, existing Windows application to a web application. Also, there are Rollapp and Cameo, which are, they do, a, it's a little different approach. They don't require any changes to your application, although I believe they do have APIs you can take advantage of, and they provide a way that you can uh, virtualize or host an existing Windows or uh, I think they also do Linux application in the cloud on their servers and then produce it, share it, give users access through uh, web browser. So I gave you a lot of information. How are you going to choose a web framework? I have this spreadsheet here, which I'll be linked on the webpage that you have access to as well, uh, but I've divided, sorted it in different ways. I'm going to go through and talk about the different options here. So as far as building a client without JavaScript knowledge, your uh, options there, you need JavaScript, A to Z, Zinterweb, and FMSoft's Unigui's have optionally, but you don't need it. Elevate Web Builder, Kit, Theus Kiddo 2, Smart Mobile Studio, and Team Web Subcore are all about being able to build an application without having JavaScript at all. So what about visual client UI designer, to be able to design the client UI visually? Uh, Cinch XJS includes Cinch Architect, which is a visual drag and drop design system. Very nice if you want to just be able to design a really fantastic UI and then produce uh, the XJS solution from that. So ones that integrate with Rad Studio, uh, all of them but Ele Web Builder, Cinch XJS, and Smart Mobile Studio integrate into Rad Studio. Um, Kitto has both its own IDE and their uh, standalone IDE, their Kitty, but you decided to use both. And then the, I believe all three of those that I say are standalone also have libraries that you can use, leverage on the Delphi side to make it compatible and work with the, what you're designing there. So which ones are, have client support, which ones have server support? Uh, again, they're listed out there and you can see which ones fall where. Licenses and availability. So this is just different licensing options. Smart Mobile Studio and TM West Subcore have a free command line compiler, but otherwise it's a commercial license. Interweb is version 14 is free, but 15 and 17 are available for buy, although 17 is in beta right now. And then Cincha XJS, it's, part, it's bundled as part of Architect, or you can buy it independently, or they have a community edition as well as uh, a GPL version for GPL application development. So lots of options here to choose from. And platforms. I broke this one out into a, its own chart just because I added three columns for the individual platforms here. Uh, Cincha XJS, TMS WebCore, and Smart Mobile Studio are not platform specific. The Smart Mobile Studio has ability to target server side as well as browser. Interweb is Windows, and then 15 and 17 adds Linux. And then uh, Web Broker, interestingly, it doesn't officially support Android, but I did some testing and you, there's a little work you can do, which I'll post the code for you can make a web broker application run on Android as well. Why would you want to do that? Uh, Raspberry Pi, other uh, single board computers running Android can now run a web broker server as well. And then Elevate Web Broker only supports the server on Windows, uh, but could work with other servers on other platforms. So you could build a server uh, using a uh, RAD server running on Linux that can then be consumed by uh, Elevate Web Builder on, in the browser. Okay, but in choosing this, I mentioned this before, I wanna mention this again. This isn't about which one's best. This is about finding the right framework to create the best solution for your project. Now, you may 
have one framework that you love and you use all the time, but then you might swap out some other framework that you use to go with that on one project versus another project. That's fine. That's one of the things I love about uh, our ecosystem with Delphi is there's lots of options, lots of things to choose from, and a lot of ways to get things done effectively. And with that, we're going to open things up to questions. One more time, we're going to call out embt.co slash webdev2019, where you will find uh, slides, links to more information, and the replay. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. There's a lot of questions here. We'll be doing our best to answer them as we go along. Um, but we'll go ahead and uh, discuss a few of these now and answer any additional questions that come in. Realize this got a little long, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of stuff we wanted to cover in more detail, but just weren't able to because of time. The objective, the purpose of the webinar was really to provide an overview of a lot of different frameworks, which unfortunately we couldn't dive into as much details as we would have liked to on the individual ones. Do check out the uh, website EMBT co slash web dev 2019 um, i'll be updating that later today with links to some more resources and more information as well uh, there's a question about whether or not uniglue works on rio since craig was using the earlier version it does work on rio uh, just craig was in the middle of reinstalling his development machines and didn't have it set up under rio so he used the earlier version And Glenn pointed out that my reference to AJAX is actually a reference to uh, HTML or XML HTTP request API, which is essentially deprecated in, fact, in favor of the new Fetch API. Um, that's true. I wasn't planning to get into a whole lot of detail on that. Probably should have uh, been a little more clear on that. So, Marco, here's a question for you. Um, do we have, since we purchased, Idera has purchased Sentra, do we have any plans of making? Uh, a web platform for FireMonkey or some sort of direct, you know, direct to web solution. Um, not strictly for FireMonkey. Uh, I've seen that. I've seen uh, there, there is another. There was another question that was raised with with some content about um, why don't we take FireMonkey and generate um, a, a web application, which is technically doable, but we try to not um i don't know confuse and 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 have a technology that is not clean and doesn't and doesn't has the same benefits on on all platforms so we could in theory um browser enable fire monkey but we will do it when we are able to do to have binary compiled code which is something might happen have Canvas supporting the same feature we support on on the native platforms, and integration with the with devices, sensors, and other features like we have on on native platforms, and the same type of performance and the same type of features. I mean, Delphi is about compiling your code. Uh, Delphi is about um, using the same code across platforms, and we don't want to come up with a platform that kind of works um if, if that's a plan i i don't think we should really do it um that doesn't mean it's not possible um it, it technologies and web technologies and browser technologies are changing rapidly so it might be in the future but but i don't see it really ready uh, now now but uh, going back to to xjs the way i see it and it doesn't cover all usage scenarios but it covers some user scenarios um is having a separation between what you're using for the server side um rot server or some other technologies for using building your web services and what you're using for building um first class ui interface that runs on the browser which could be xas and it could be something else i know customers using angular using uh, Vue.js, which is another new new thing and, and so forth um for large uh, and and high quality and flexible and scalable application, I think having this separation makes sense. But that doesn't mean that the server side tool cannot help with the client side and somehow vice versa. So improving the way you work 
on, on the two technologies, making them less separate and providing an easy, easy um, model, like for example, a wizard that generates like a starting point application for you and, and other things in that space. These are really um, technology we're considering and uh, we could provide in a relatively short time frame. Uh, a deeper integration like FireMonkey generating um, a web app that might come, but it's not planned at this point in time. Okay, sorry, I had muted myself. Uh, there's a, a few questions about why doesn't Embarcadero just buy X and make it part of the product? And then of course somebody else said, no, don't buy that one, buy this one. And someone else said, wait, wait, buy this one, this is the best. And I think that kind of answers the question. Is yeah, us? I tend to agree. When it, whenever we do a survey and we ask, what are you using out of these like 20 web technologies? The one that shines out and is highly used gets eight <laughs> percent, and everyone is is lower than that. It's it's spread out, and and that makes sense because there are different technologies that suit different needs. And the other thing is that we we're not entering a green field. I mean, it's not like if we were in the scenario that we have a thousand customers, none of them has done web development. We offer a solution that becomes the solution. But the reality is that out of a thousand of our customers, 900 or well, maybe 800 have done something with the web. The other 200 don't care, don't need it. And those 800 have already done something. And yes, they might switch, but they might be happy with what they have and their existing code. So it is extremely difficult to come up with something that is so great, so astonishing that everyone wants to switch. And if not, we can provide a solution for 10% of the customers, making the the other 90% unhappy and the third-party vendors extremely unhappy <laughs> if we buy and distribute and bundle uh, an alter uh, one of the options. So ultimately, the best service is to be flexible, be open, offer good foundations. Uh, again, web services is a critical enterprise feature um, but for the rest we can help any of the third parties um, have good support good integration and let our customers choose what what they need i mean it yeah there is a price thing but well if we had like to buy a big company and bundle it we'll have to increase the price for how much you're paying for the third party solution so it's not really i mean a cost saving thing only yeah yeah exactly and I, I would love it if everything was free and just included, but that, that, that doesn't usually work that way. Sure, no, if I go to a manager and say, yeah, we should spend like that money for this product and we won't charge anything to our customer, we're just making it free. I mean, it, it's it's hard to convince. Yeah, it doesn't, I mean, the technology is exciting, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out the business to make it. Yeah, and, and there is another angle. And which is which is a risk that we always incur when we buy a technology that we buy, it's great, we drop it there, and then we don't have the focus, resources, care to keep maintaining and supporting it. That would be the worst thing. I mean, buy something and then after two or three years, it's broken and we don't fix it. I mean, that's the last thing our customers want, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah, and we don't want it either. I mean, it, it really makes no sense. But that's the risk we would we would face because uh, we might have something more relevant, like creating a compiler for a new platform that drag. I mean, that takes a huge amount of our focus, and uh, and we would face the risk of not maintaining supporting the technology in the same way our third party vendors can do and generally do. Even even some of the open source products mentioned have great support, a great community behind them. Yeah, absolutely. So th there's a question here, it says, we, we want to provide functions of an already written comm server in a web user GUI. Which framework would we recommend? Um, well, if the plan is not to touch it, <laughs> uh, I, I would I would suggest going towards some, some um, Client sharing mechanism. I mean, you run the application on a Windows machine and share and share the UI. I mean, some there are there are some that are specific, 
like virtual UI and others, I mean, tied to Delphi, but even a bunch of general solutions for sharing a streaming uh, at a Windows desktop. And at times, this is the easiest and, and simplest thing to do. Uh, and it's actually quite cost effective as well. Yeah. Um, you could, you could uh, additionally, you could uh, add modules to RAD server that just called into your comm service and exposed to this REST. It really depends on how your comm server works, and there's lots of things. DataSnap does have comm decom support in, uh, backwards compatibility. So, uh, yeah, D -D -com, I mean, DataSnap could be a great solution, but I would have recommended that. 10 years ago, <laughs> more than today. Um, technically, yeah, you can, ex DataSnap exposes a server that is compatible with Calm in all sense and effects, and it can expose this as an HTTP endpoint. Um, so you can call your Calm server via HTTP, but uh, I would, I don't think it's really the way to the future. I mean, it's not like being like a REST server with a proper API, a clean API, a clean solution. For compatibility purposes, DataSnap has, has, could be a great opportunity. Um, yeah. There's a question here about WebAssembly. I, I, we don't have any plans to compile the WebAssembly on our roadmap. I mean, it would be cool. I, I know some of the tech partners, or I believe some of the tech partners are planning to uh, compile the WebAssembly from uh, in their transpilers, but uh, I don't know for sure. It, it's a very interesting technology that we're monitoring. So we don't have any plan or anything to announce now, but it it is, as I was mentioning before, we, we, we are getting to a point that the browser is more and more powerful and allows more and more. So at some point we'll be able to take like Delphi and PrimeMonkey and have everything right, right writing first class uh, in the browser. And and so, yeah, that's something that might happen, but it's not a, a, a short-term plan. Um, there's a question here, if the transpilers support uh, T REST client, I know all of the trans, I believe all the transpilers have some sort of REST client functionality, but I don't know if it is exactly uh, code compatible with the T REST client. So that's the thing about the transpilers is their it's their own dialect of of uh, object Pascal and their own um, RTL and components. So you're not going to get 100% code reuse between them and Delphi. Um, but it is a way you can, as a Delphi developer, get on the web. So that's why they're included here. But yeah, they're not. Uh, it's not 100% compatible, and there's really not plans to make them 100% compatible because there are some things that make sense for that platform versus uh, the platform we're going at, which Marco also alluded to, you know, that we were really looking at how to make the same code work across all the platforms as best as possible, so. Yeah, and then uh, someone's pointed out that WebCore can be hosted on uh, little tiny Arduino devices. Exactly, yeah, there's lots of, lots of cool things you can do with, uh, with the transpiler web core and uh, SMS and Elevate. And there's actually more, I believe, out there as well. Uh, Marco, here's a question here about what happened to Delphi for PHP was a good solution. Um, it, it was an interesting solution. Uh, actually, it, some of the, in its, when it started, it was kind of even ahead of its time and, and quite powerful. Um, it, it, everything happened before I joined the company, so it's not that I have like a first first hand <laughs> information. But uh, the tool was very good. The idea was very good. It was so good that we we engaged. I mean, we we got some of the developers to build to ha start working on the Rust Studio ID, and then it became became like their focus. And so the the the, the PHP side was a bit uh, neglected. Um, I mean, making money with with a tool for what is basically an open source scenario and environment is tricky. Uh, that's true for JavaScript, I mean, editors and tools, or for, or for um, PHP libraries and tools. 
uh, it is possible, but it, it is not trivial. So part of it is was it was a very nice technology, but um, it didn't have like a great business around it. Uh, partially was it was a bit neglected because the developers were great and and they were leveraged to build um, to build other other software. Um, so it uh, we we ended up retiring it. Uh, unfortunately, because again, I, I I think for the technical capabilities and features and for what the product had, uh, it was a very interesting product. Yeah. Yes, agreed. There's a question here. What framework is most similar to ASP.NET, MVC, and Delphi? So I would say that probably would be most like uh, IntraWeb because ASP.NET is a server-side technology, right? So IntraWeb or UniGUI, where you are uh, defining your, I don't know, that's different. Hmm. I guess the most like ASP, P.NET MVC would probably be, I don't know, Mark, what do you think? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the, the MVC part is in Daniele Tati framework. Some yeah. of the other, fee and, and partially in more mode, although more mode is, is, is slightly different in the, in the approach, is more of a norm, an object relation mapping layer as, as the foundation. Um, but the client side is different, so it's, and, and, yeah, I mean, ASP has like a million, a million variations. So, the, I mean, the, the Microsoft ASP.NET has a million variations. So, it uh, depends on the angle and the and the like. Even the the client, the HTML can be scripted in different ways. Uh, you have different technologies as part of the same overall architecture. Um, I don't think there's anything that exactly matches the Microsoft solution, uh, but there are a few that that come. That come close. Yeah, I would. I would think you'd probably be using something like um, the MVC framework, right? Because it's a backend solution. But then you could also combine that with maybe one of the transpilers to create a JavaScript UI. Although with MVC framework, you'd be writing in plain JavaScript. So I guess you could do that too. So yeah. Or with, um, sorry, with ASP.NET since it's server side. Uh, let's see. So is HTML5 builder uh, dead, deprecated, no longer supported? Um, it's no longer distributed and sold, I think. That's my understanding. Is there any chance that it might become open source or a community edition? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> I would have to ask. Um, I've discovered, unfortunately, that sometimes that is a lot more complicated than you would think it would be. <laughs> um, it is, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, okay, uh, let's see, I think, oh, so there's a comment here about RAD server user management. Um, yeah, I mean, Rod Server has some support for um, some flexibility in terms of user management. You can read it. Basically, you can create your own login and partial user management module. Uh, there is a specific way to register your user management module to replace the, the, the stock one. Specifically, you can, the, the main idea behind it is that you can, rather than having Rod Server have the user and the password, um, Rod Server needs the user account, but could be copied from some other internal system. And the validation of the of the user with the password can be completely external. And I think we still ship a demo that would um, that shows how to create a custom uh, login and use Active Directory to uh, validate the credentials of the user. So Rod Server would not have over here like an empty password field and the, the validation would happen against an external system. That would be up to you to fetch data for the user from that system or from 
local storage or, or whatsoever. You still need to have the user account on the system. Um, so the, the username, entry, uh, but that's all that's strictly needed. Uh, and that's used for like uh, analytics and, and, and other features. Now, if, uh, if I saw the question, the question is interesting. If there is anything that you feel we should do or change or do differently, I'm, I'm open, send me an email, marco.cantonbarcadero.com, because we are in the process of adding more features in that space for Rat Server, so I'm always looking forward for, for additional ideas. Okay, and there was a, a couple of questions about scalability, simultaneous connections, et cetera. So, we didn't really get into this, but most of them do, the server-side solutions do have um, load balancing and scalability f features around that. And additionally, really the hardware, the amount of hardware you have running it is going to have a huge impact on the load it can take, as well as the way your solution's implemented, right? How much, how much data are you sending back and forward with each connection? So it's hard to answer that with definitive numbers. I mean, you could give numbers, but then they would be totally different than your situation because everything would be different. So, uh, but yeah, most of them, like I said, do have do have features around scalability and load balancing that would certainly could improve that and make it very responsive. And uh, Alf just pointed out that last uh, week TMS had a web core webinar, and so if you head out to the TMS's website, you can certainly get more information about web core. Yes, Rebecca. Jim and Marco, I'm I'm gonna pull the uh, time check on you guys. Um, we're an hour and a half in, so it's yeah. uh, kind of time to wrap it up. Maybe take one more question before we close. Well, here's one that just came in. Has Idera contemplated offering a virtual server solution as a subscription offering, i.e., a RAD server interface, something auto configured? Um, not, I don't know that we've talked about doing it as a subscription offering, but I know there's been discussion about how to make that easier for people to have that configured and stuff. That's something certainly interested in uh, from a, a DevOps point of view, and hopefully you have some some stuff around that in the near future. Yeah, yeah, we're consider. I mean, we're clearly considering making it first. It's much much easier to to deploy and provide ready to use um, like images and other solutions. But we are also been discussing options in terms of uh, paying for for use slash execution uh, through, I mean, not something we would host and handle, but through external um, vendors. For example, Amazon offers it. If you have an EMI, you can rent your your uh, Amazon virtual machine, including the, the the software cost. So, it nothing nothing ready, nothing to announce, but it's an interesting concept that we are exploring. Yeah, there's a, a lot of potential. I mean, Adara's acquired a number of great other technologies that there's a lot of potential for integration and uh, us to learn from other uh, members of the Adara family. So there's a lot of exciting stuff we're hoping to have in the future, for sure. All right, well, great, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Oh, um, Rad Server needs to work on MySQL others as the core system. So Marco can add to this, but Rad Server can internally it uses interbase but it can work with any database on the back end so yeah. your database is the database you pick the internal system in terms of some of the internal architecture it needs to be one specific database it would be extremely difficult to make it efficient and working properly throughout all options but you don't need an interbase license that that license for that specific database is the rad server license and you can use for for your relational database storage any system you want, whether it's Oracle, MySQL, uh, anything, anything you like. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, uh, excited to put this webinar together. And like I said, do stay tuned to that enbt.co slash web dev 2019. I will be updating that with uh, resources and links for everyone there. So thanks everybody for joining us. And we look forward to seeing all the great web solutions that you build with these uh with all the different options you have now thanks bye bye